Hello, I'm Andrew Lowe, and welcome to the project on the pursuit of the perfect portfolio. Today, I have the pleasure and the honor of speaking with Bill Sharp, the originator of the capital asset pricing model and the person who many believe to be the founder of passive investing and what many of us now engage in on a daily basis with our own portfolios. Uh, Bill, thank you very much for joining us today. My great pleasure, Andy, to be with you. So I would like to start by uh, getting your thoughts on where passive investing is today and how far it's come. Because uh, uh, back in the 1960s, uh, we saw the beginning of passive investing with uh, John Bogle, of course. But actually, Bogle gives credit to you and Bill Faust and John McQuown. So can you tell us a little bit about that time and uh, how it really came about from the conception of your ideas of passive investing to actual implementation? Well, I, my recollection is that there was uh, Roger Ibbotson and Rex Singfield had a, a venture going with a bank in Chicago, I can't remember the name of the bank, uh, which was more or less at about the same time as the Wells Fargo venture. I actually started with another group that was going to do an index fund, um, but it, the business side didn't work out. Uh, and that would have, I think, preceded the Wells Fargo. Um, the um, Wells Fargo venture, uh, I had a little role in that, uh, other than from my academic work. I had a call from a chap who was the son, I believe, of the head of Samsonite Luggage Company, who had just finished an MBA at Chicago and had been studying the academic literature. and said, uh, really like to get something for the, I think it was for the pension fund for the company, uh, that was more consistent with, you know, equilibrium ideas, etc. cetera. And um, so I put him in touch with Bill Faust, uh, whom I knew personally. And the original design, I believe, for that fund was to be an equal weighted market port portfolio but cooler heads prevailed, and I think, uh, and it became a, a cap weighted, let's call it. Well, in fact, I think that according to uh, Bill Faust, uh, it was uh, 100 uh, NYSE stocks initially that was equal weighted and was rebalanced <laughs> once a month. Mm -hmm. And uh, apparently, it was a, a nightmare to yeah, administer I think, I think because they, of that trading. Uh, yeah, I, that's correct. I think they, they realized this. This was difficult to implement, right. and of course it was inconsistent with the theory. Mm -hmm. And then Mac McQuown uh, had been, was at that time still, I think, the head of a, sort of an operations research group at Wells. And mm -hmm. so he and Bill, in various combinations, brought about the, uh, the first you know, serious major index fund, I guess you'd say. Now, this was 1969, 71, around that time? I'll have to time? trust your memory because yeah. I don't remember the exact date. So what strikes well, me is... No, it happened, you know, it must have been a little later because I was at Stanford at the time, so it was possibly mm -hmm. in the 70, maybe 71 time okay. period. But what's amazing to me is that your thesis was in 1961. So this was just a few years after mm -hmm. your thesis that these ideas were implemented. A really fascinating read because the first few chapters uh, were applications of portfolio optimization and you give a lot of credit to Harry Markowitz for uh, working with you. He was at the Rand Corporation at the time. But the last chapter of your thesis, uh, chapter five, was on a positive theory of security mm -hmm. market behavior. And that's when you decided to take all of the portfolio optimization and ask the simple question, uh, not so simple back then, but certainly simple in retrospect, what would happen if everybody behaved this way? And of course, we've got the capital asset mm -hmm. pricing model to thank for the outcome of that uh, thought process. Um, how did you come upon that? I, I mean, that just seemed like something that was really quite a remarkable set of insights that came out of nowhere. Well, uh, let me back up a little. <clears throat> I had actually started a dissertation on uh, internal transfer pricing using all kinds of operations research tools, which I thought was really quite good. And um, building on the work of Jack Hirschleifer, it turned out Jack came to UCLA about the time I was, I thought, halfway through my dissertation. Mm -hmm. 
And so Armin Alchin, my advisor, said, well, why don't you go talk to Jack Kerslifer? And I did, and I gave him the, the chapters that I'd finished and went back in a week, and he said, I don't think there's a dissertation here. So I went to Fred Weston, who was also my advisor and a uh, big influence on me, and said, what am I going to do, Fred? And Fred said, well, remember in the seminar you really liked the work of this guy Markowitz, and I think he's just come to Rand, where I was at the time. Let's go talk to him. So I introduced myself to Harry, and we chatted for an extended period of time. And basically, Fred Weston, Armin Alchin on the faculty at UCLA made a deal that Harry would, in effect, be my dissertation advisor, although he was not on the faculty. So uh, Harry was very much a big influence. And uh, to your question, um, there were three basic pieces to that dissertation. It was all predicated on uh, what I like to call the single index model of security return formation, uh, which was in Harry's book, uh, or I sometimes call it the diagonal model. The first one, in any event, I, I developed an algorithm that could very efficiently solve a problem in that special case, a general portfolio theory, portfolio optimization problem. And the second chapter, at Fred's urging, I worked with an actual human financial advisor, try to capture his predictions probabilistically, and then do the efficient portfolio thing. And we could talk about that separately. But then in the third, and uh, so the first was pretty much Harry's idea that I should try to do something in terms of efficient algorithms. Second was Fred's idea I should try this with a human being. And the third was just, it, it wasn't really Armin's idea, I don't believe, but it was just what he had taught me to do. Uh, as you know, microeconomics is, you make a model of, say, how firms behave and how individual consumers behave. And then you build um, a theory or a model of what would happen to prices in a marketplace where you have these actors doing their thing. So I thought, well, you know, that's what a microeconomist would do. And, and here we have a theory about people dealing with probabilistic outcomes, mm -hmm. uh, a la Markowitz. And let's, let me just think about what if everybody did what Harry said. Um, what would happen to the prices of securities, mm -hmm. and what would that imply for expected returns and risks. But in the dissertation, it was all predicated on this single model, one factor, if you will, a return generating process. And then, to, to finish that story, um, I, went, I finished the dissertation in June, started at the University of Washington in September, and thought, this is a really great result. I wonder if I can generalize it. And so I spent several months trying to figure out how to do it without sort of putting the rabbit in the hat. Mm -hmm. Was there a way to pull the rabbit out of the hat without putting it in to begin with? Mm -hmm. And I, I figured out, yes, there was. So you know, your thesis was interesting in a number of respects. One, because it was actually working on a topic that wasn't particularly popular in economics at the time. Isn't that the case? It really wasn't in economics. Right. Uh, well, Fred Weston had been trained as an economist and then had taken a position in basically corporate finance um, at, in the business school at UCLA. I took a field with him, although my, my work was in economics. And I was his research assistant, one of many as well. And he had been bringing, and, and others were just beginning to bring economics into uh, finance. Mm. But it certainly wasn't, there wasn't much economics in finance, and there wasn't much uncertainty right. in economics at that point. Arrow and DeBruy's work came later. Mm -hmm. And your thesis was interesting in that it took theory and actually applied it as well. So uh, I noticed that in the appendix, you actually have Fortran code. <laughs> that, I do, I do. Uh, uh, which I can understand, actually. <laughs> I'm one of the few. Uh, but uh, it, it was actually. Uh, I think it was uh, Fortran 2 at the time. <laughs> and it, and it, was, it was very applied. At, at the same time, it was also extraordinarily theoretical. It was really the, the, both extremes were represented. 
That must have been unusual as well, wasn't it, at the time? Well, I think that probably reflected the fact that I was at the RAND Corporation. Mm -hmm. uh, at RAND, although I was not a programmer, mm -hmm. uh, we were all the people doing the basic research, the, the research, were encouraged to learn programming in order to be able to better work with the real programmers. Right. And so I took internal classes on programming and uh, absolutely loved it. And uh, so, and I, I loved algorithms uh, as well. And so, and that was the era in which operations research we thought was going to save the world. Mm -hmm. So RAND was just a hotbed of operations research and computer science and um, we had some very powerful for the day equipment and um, so I, I became hooked on programming. I even created a programming language and wrote a compiler and uh, <laughs> you know we, we talk that's the dark side of my life I suppose. <laughs> I still program almost every day. <laughs> so, you know, we noticed that in your thesis, uh, you mentioned that the analysis was for 96 stocks uh, and that it cost $300 of programming time on the mainframe computer at the time to run that analysis. Yeah. To be perfectly frank, I ran it at RAND, so it was free. I see. <laughs> for me, but it was in an IBM 709, I believe it was, or it could have been a yeah. 704. Um, and uh, but that's what it would have cost commercially. Right. Um, and yes, I mean my algorithm, which today, you know, yawn, but uh, <laughs> it, it would have saved an awful lot of money yeah. at the time. Yes, it, it was it was a totally different world, and you had to do key punch cards. And I was so good because I did all my own key punching and all my data. But I was so good at key punching. I figured if things didn't go well in the economics business. Uh, or finance business, I could always be a programmer. Be a no, a key punch operator. <laughs> key punch operator, <laughs> really good. <laughs> so the, the capital asset pricing model uh, has as one of its main features the importance of the market portfolio, the tangency portfolio, um, and again, that's one of these ideas where after the fact, after you understand it, it seems so simple and obvious, but beforehand, yes. nobody really understood any of it, and the role of systematic versus idiosyncratic risk. So to me, that really is the heart of passive investing. It's the fact that mm -hmm. you've got this passive portfolio that actually provides some really incredible opportunities for investors to set their portfolios on automatic pilot. Um, what's your sense of how quickly that idea was adopted? Because while Wells Fargo and the Samsonite Corporation were you know, leaders and pioneers, it took a while before John Bogle was able to take that idea and turn it into the behemoth that we now know as Vanguard. Well, um, I guess there are two, two sides of that. One is, how long did it take the, the economics and finance profession to sort of become interested in mm -hmm. the theory? Mm -hmm. And then there was, how long did it take the industry to become interested in, in the practical implications? Um, I remember the uh, CAPM article, which went around through a refereeing editorial process for three years, uh, finally was published in 64. And I knew at the time, and I'm sure I was right, that was going to be the best paper I ever wrote. <laughs> and uh, and uh, nothing has, has convinced me of, that, I, that I wasn't right about that. And so the question was, how good was it? Mm -hmm. And so I sat by the phone, we didn't have email then, uh, waiting uh, for the phone to ring or people to send letters and nothing, zero, <laughs> nada. Uh, finally, after about a year, people started paying some attention to it. Um, and I was focused more then on the adoption by, of the ideas by the, the profession, the academic profession. Um, but that took a while. But once that got started, mm. you know, there was a lot of, lot of activity for and against. And, um, but the, uh, the implementation was just glacial. Mm. It just took forever. Um, because, you know, it, it sort of went against everything people in the investment industry did. Mm. Um, 
there was even an ad taken out by somebody, a four-page ad in one of the investment bank, trade magazines, uh, professional magazines, with an Uncle Sam uh, saying, indexed investing is un-American. Really? <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, well, may I tell one other anecdote? Please. Because there, there was sort of two aspects of this. Uh, there was also the idea that, um, that, you know, it was really dumb to just buy everything in market proportions, that you needed intelligent people doing research, etc. And so there was the whole random walk movement out of MIT mainly, mm -hmm. Paul Kuttner's book mm -hmm. with that name. Paul, who uh, was at one point addressing 500 securities people in New York after the Random Walk book had come out, and the person who introduced him was a leading person from the industry, and he said, uh, as he finished the introduction, I have one question for you, Professor Kuttner. If you're so smart, why aren't you rich? And of course, I got a big applause. So Paul went to the podium and said, well, I have one question for you, whatever his name was. If you're so rich, why aren't you smart? <laughs> <laughs> Thereby setting back the academic professional sure. interaction by at least a decade. <laughs> but but there, was, there was huge resistance in the industry to the yeah. idea that it could possibly be that simple and, 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 and a lack of understanding that that was an implication of, of people in the industry being really smart, or mm -hmm. at least right. enough of them being smart. But it went against all the commercial interests of almost everybody. Sure. Well, the 1960s and 70s in the, in the uh, investment industry was the era of the gunslinger. You mm -hmm. know, the, 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 the meltdown. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it seems like your work has really... Nifty 50, they were. The Nifty the 50 Nifty 50, stars. yes. That's right. <laughs> And your work ha has really, uh, in my view, democratized investing in the sense that you've taken mm -hmm. investing out of the hands of the so-called experts or gunslingers and you put it into the hands of individual investors, people who don't know a lot about investing but can still get a decent rate of return, invest for their retirement by investing in this passive portfolio. Uh, I would say Yes, that's true, and that's a good thing. Uh, it's a very good thing. Um, on the other hand, I think it's important to understand that all index funds are not equally mm. socially responsible. Mm -hmm. So, as we know, a lot of the narrower, let me call them index funds, uh, are being used egregiously for, first of all, they tend to be expensive, mm -hmm. and they're being used for day trading and Lord knows what, mm -hmm. and all kinds of gambling and, and betting activity. And the other thing I think that, that we should always remember is there's a kind of an irony. The market portfolio, passive, highly diversified portfolio, makes sense only to the extent that there are people trying to beat the market. Mm -hmm keeping prices of individual securities and sectors reasonably in line with probabilistic forecasts, let mm -hmm. me say it. So, so there is this, this concern. We used to be worried a lot, I and many others, what if there were too many dollars in index, you know, broad index funds? Uh, I think at this point, you know, we don't have to worry about that much. Um, the intent to bet and gamble you know, and the, and the desire mm -hmm. uh, seems to be alive and well. So, right. so people are still doing some kind of research, right. fundamental research. But, but it really is important that there be fundamental research, and there has to be some sort of reward for at least the people who do the research. Right. So, hedge fund managers do play a role in this ecosystem. Well, I mean, it could also be people who build portfolios of industry stocks. Right. Uh, sure. I'm not sure it has. Sure, it has to be hedge fund managers. Right. So um, your love of software is something that has never left you. As you point out, you still program today. Um, I, I want to turn now to financial engines because that's an instantiation of your love of software and technology as well as your interest in helping investors. So can you tell us a little bit about that and how that came about? Sure. Let me give you a little bit of a backstory. <clears throat> in the uh, prior period, uh, 
my wife and I actually uh, had a research and consulting firm um, working with institutional investors, pension funds, endowments, mm -hmm. um, um, helping them with what they did. And uh, for whatever, for personal reasons and, and other reasons, it seemed I did go back to academics. And it seemed to me that we were beginning this shift from institutional investing for retirement in particular uh, to find benefit plans where the investment was done by professionals, if you will, at, at the corporations and employers to um, individuals being responsible for their own investment 401k plans, etc. And uh, so I decided to shift my research in that direction, hmm. uh, sort of declare a victory on <laughs> the, the other front where I'd been working for a long time and um, work on the problems of the individual choosing vehicles offered by the employer, etc. And I was doing that uh, in straight academic mode. I was writing programs, putting them on the nascent, mm -hmm. then nascent web, et cetera. And um, a colleague of mine uh, in the law school, uh, it was security, Joe Grunfest, mm -hmm. been on the SEC. Mm -hmm. And I were having coffee, and, and he gave me a long song and dance about how if I really wanted to impact real people making these decisions, we needed to form a firm, mm -hmm. et cetera. Mm -hmm. So th that was sort of how financial engines began. And so he introduced me to uh, a fellow who was a lawyer who also could start, help start firms, mm -hmm. and um, Craig Johnson. So the three of us basically created financial engines. Mm -hmm. And the goal was to help individual employees better use the 401k plans that were available to them for retirement savings. And, and, that, and, and of course, the idea was to apply all the work that had been done in the academic finance field, mm -hmm. um, which we set about doing. Mm -hmm. So uh, that uh, company is quite successful today, but it, it was uh, slow going at the first, uh, wasn't it? Uh, it was a bit yes. of a challenge to get people to understand how to use the system. And, uh, oh, yes. Um, there's a case that was written uh, by, I think, someone at Harvard um, about that. And, and uh, it was really very simple. You just have four different business, completely different business plans, mm -hmm. and then on the fifth, it clicks. Uh, so we tried retail, we tried online, we tried this, we tried that, mm. until um, we finally hit on what at least at that time was the, um, the appropriate venue, mm -hmm. which was to provide all the software online and offline as needed to all the employees of a large employer. Mm -hmm. Um, and then uh, make individual accounts with individual management available mm -hmm. to any of those employees who wanted to go beyond what was uh, provided by the employer mm -hmm. to, to all the employees. And, and so, so our, uh, the per, it was sort of like textbooks. Mm -hmm. uh, they're used by students, but you sell to the professor. Mm -hmm. And our service was used by the employees, right. but we sold to the employer. Yeah, and it's been quite successful, I understand. It, it, uh, it has. It's, uh, I'm, I'm long since retired from the company, mm -hmm. so, so I don't have any insight as to details now other than what's publicly available. But um, yes, it's, it's depending on the day of the week, it's a one and a half or a two billion dollar public company. Oh, that's fantastic. And so, you know, and I think they have under management if something like, you know, well, it's, it's, it's very large. It's the largest registered investment advisor in the U.S. Right. <clears throat> so it's been very gratifying. And you've been thinking about how investors look at their investments for quite some time. In fact, in your thesis, you actually had some work on subjective probabilities and preferences. Mm -hmm. And uh, your Princeton lectures were focused on looking at uh, ways of modeling preferences. And 
what do you think the biggest challenges are for a typical investor? Uh, because you've spent a lot of time oh. thinking about the, the ordinary individual, not the finance professor, but uh, people who don't have any finance background. What are they up against? Well, the, um, it, it's, you know, perhaps jump ahead. It's, it, I and many others focused for many years on what we call the accumulation phase. Mm -hmm. You're saving for your retirement. And, and while that was difficult because it was a multi-period problem en route, we could sort of take a shortcut and say, well, what you care about is the probability distribution of your wealth on the day you retire. Mm -hmm. and, and we could sort of stop at that point. So at least, you know, there were multiple periods getting there, but at least there was one distribution that was the um, object of choice uh, or of analysis. And, um, and, and of course, if you leave aside issues like human capital and some other things, you could argue, and we'll talk later about, perhaps about the perfect portfolio, mm -hmm. that the investment decision was really pretty simple. If you had access to a, a truly diversified, mm -hmm. true broad market portfolio, you just divide your money between that and something low or very low risk, mm -hmm. either low real, you know, low real risk or possibly low nominal risk. Now, in a 401k plan, you don't have that luxury. You have to work with whatever the investment vehicles mm -hmm. are that the employer makes available. Mm -hmm. So that's a more difficult problem. Um, but, you know, you could say, well, we could characterize your preferences by some measure of risk aversion vis-a-vis -vis the money you have the mm -hmm. day you retire. Mm -hmm. And that's a one parameter mm -hmm. kind of thing, and that's, that's, that's helpful. I'm now devoting my effort to the decumulation phase. Mm -hmm. What do you do after you retire, mm -hmm. or on the day you retire? How do you allocate money and investment, etc.? cetera? Uh, over the years you have left, with whatever they may be. That's a much, much, much harder problem. Mm, why is that? Oh, well, let me count the ways. First of all, you don't know how long you're going to live mm -hmm. or how long your wife or partner is going to live. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> second, uh, you know, there are many alternative investment strategies, even though they may ideally all have some market base, mm -hmm. but they don't have to be just the market and something riskless. And and third, we really don't know what people's preferences are. Mm. You know, we have ways of, of modeling that, um, that make some assumptions that are pretty much inconsistent with a lot of the behavioral literature, mm -hmm. even more so than the ones we've been doing on the accumulation phase. So it's a very, very difficult problem. Mm. Um, you still, I think, can structure it so you choose what I call a riskless asset and a market-based portfolio, mm -hmm. which is something that has only market risk, but not necessarily the broad market portfolio. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so it's a very difficult problem. Mm. And, um, but you can certainly, if, if you're so inclined, <laughs> cut the investment alternatives down to reasonably small number mm -hmm. uh, by assuming some kind of an equilibrium model mm -hmm. in the decumulation problem and the accumulation problem, really. You kind of need a multi-period equilibrium model, mm -hmm. not the one-period kind of mm -hmm. CAPM, but that's not horribly hard to get. Mm -hmm. Given the popularity of apps and uh, robo-advisors, do you think there's a possibility that will actually be able to automate some of these decisions because uh, uh, the first phase of the democratization of investing is what you and other pioneers did uh, in the 70s and, and 80s. Uh, but now is there a second stage where we can take what you did at Financial Engines and really uh, scale it so that uh, we put these uh, kinds of automated tools in the hands of typical individuals? 
Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I was at a conference and somebody asked me about robo-advisors. It was the day that Schwab announced they were going to do it, something mm -hmm. in the area. And, uh, and somebody mentioned, you know, said, well, Financial Engines is a robo-advisor, uh, to which I said, I'm, I'm not sure that <laughs> they want to be considered such. And fortunately, the, right. one of the officers was in the audience, so I asked him. And, uh -huh. He wasn't quite sure at that point, although right. I, I, there's a tendency in the f trade literature to refer to financial engines as a robo-advisor. Um, and certainly, they use a lot of technology right. in the advice, but they have human beings too. Um, but yes, I, I, I certainly think much more can be done, although I'm a little disturbed. I, I, I haven't looked at many of them, but I looked at one which would be neat remain nameless, where I happen to know a lot of the principles of the new retail, let's call them robo-advisors. Mm -hmm. And they, they have all of their um, methodology online, so you can see absolutely everything. And they use low-cost index funds. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's, you go right down the line, yes, 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 that's, that's, mm -hmm. that's what we all have advocated. But then, if you dig deeply, you find <clears throat> that, and they even use what I used to call reverse optimization, where they, they get a covariance matrix and they get expected returns by assuming the market is mm -hmm. portfo portfolio is efficient, so you back out expected returns, mm -hmm. which would be consistent with equilibrium, mm -hmm. so sort of a CAPM thing. Sure. And thus far, you know, yes, yes, you know, good for them. Uh, and then it turns out they put in some, quote, views mm -hmm. and use a procedure built on reverse optimization that Fisher Black and Bob Litterman developed to mix views of sectors in their case, so like value stocks, small stocks, sectors that they think are better than they mm -hmm. should be or worse than they should be mm -hmm. as an investment. And then they back out adjusted expected returns. Okay. And then their advice is predicated on those. Oh. Um, and so uh, I was with them until they did that. <laughs> you know? And I don't know if, if there are some of the others that, that, that just do everything they do and stop yeah. before that, that latter stage. Yeah. But, but it's, it's so, again, the issue is do you really want to you know, make bets according to somebody's beliefs about markets being out of whack? Mm -hmm. And in the old days, it was on individual stocks and bonds, and now it tends to be on sectors, mm -hmm. or you know, value stocks, or growth stocks, or big stocks, or small stocks, or you know, chemistry stocks versus whatever. And um, there's been what I consider a perversion of the index philosophy with all these narrow ETFs mm -hmm. with incredible turnover. Mm -hmm. um, so. I don't know whether it's better to do a lot high turnover betting on sectors. Hedge funds, of course, are mm -hmm. the extreme case. Mm -hmm. um, or in the old days where you bet on you know, this utility versus that utility and you sat on them. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but I don't advocate either. And, and I think you said expenses really matter. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's, it's, it's really important to understand that an absolutely abhorrent amount of money is being transferred from ordinary individuals trying to save and finance their retirement in particular to the financial industry. I mean, there's just so much needless expense uh, for which they're getting nothing mm -hmm. uh, of any real value. And uh, if you look at the retirement income area now as increasing numbers of people are coming to their retirement with serious amounts of money to invest mm -hmm. didn't used to happen because we had didn't have defined contribution savings plans um, every part of the industry and parts that you wouldn't even think of as being in the finance industry are trying to get a piece of that that pie mm -hmm. and they're offering uh, they're very good. Many of them are very good behavioral analysts. They know how to create a product or a service that sounds just great, right. <clears throat> but ends up 
sucking a huge amount of the value out of these retirement savings. And, and I find that, you know, absolutely scandalous. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it's the finance industry and the academic part of the finance field, we've got to somehow or other educate people so they're not suckered into these uh, systems that play to people's behavioral tendencies. Right. We need some anti-marketing. And, and give them yeah. give them something that is just not appropriate. Mm -hmm. That's my crusade. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, so we're getting closer to the, uh, uh, the bottom line question for all of these considerations, which is uh, what you consider to be, to be the perfect portfolio, uh, the $64 trillion question, I guess. Um, in preparation for that, um, let me get a sense uh, from you as to whether or not uh, the financial crisis of a few years ago has changed your thinking at all about how people go out investing. Uh, has, the, uh, has the crisis really caused you to rethink any of the basic principles of uh, financial management? Um. <laughs> Probably far less than it should have. Um, I mean, all of the theory is predicated on best estimates of probability distributions of future outcomes, mm -hmm. uh, not frequency distributions of things that happened in the past. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, uh, who knows what the best probability distribution was just before the meltdown mm -hmm. and whether that was a two sigma or a three sigma or a five sigma event. Um, and so, you know, I don't, I do, um, I, I think it's important that people understand that really bad things can happen, mm -hmm. you know, that it, uh, I think, Perhaps we were being, some were being lulled into a sense of, well, we've got all these wonderful things in place. We couldn't have a replay of the Great Depression, mm -hmm. uh, or at least the stock market side of it. Um, but no, I, I don't think so. I mean, I, I, uh, I think you might worry about what probability distributions you use, but sort of the theories have always said, you know, given a consensus view of the probabilities of different things happening in the real economy, mm -hmm. prices will be set thus and so, and this will, there will be this relationship. Mm -hmm. um, and um, all the tests, of course, m most of the empirical tests have implicitly or explicitly assumed that at each point, in time, people assume the future would be like it was over the, whatever historic period you're using for your empirical analysis. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's a very, very large assumption, and and you know if I can say we theoreticians never assume that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, many of us, including my limited empirical work, said, well, let's kind of see if that if historic outcomes w or, or are reasonable proxy for what people thought at each point in time during the historic period mm -hmm. uh, and, and see if there's any consistency with mm -hmm. our theories. But um, that's a big assumption. Sure. And if, if, if you don't pass that test, then some would say we haven't. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that means you throw out the theory. Right. Okay, so with that in mind, uh, what would you consider to be the perfect portfolio? Well, strange you should ask <laughs> <laughs> because uh, I'm, I'm now working on a book in this retirement income area, mm -hmm. and uh, so there came a point at which I had to, I had to answer the question. Uh -huh. um, and so I went, I've said this in print for many, 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 many years, decades. Um, ideally, it would be a combination of a riskless, real portfolio, mm -hmm. something like tips or mm -hmm. something where... Index to inflation. Right. Yeah. Uh, and all the tradable bonds and stocks in the world mm -hmm. <laughs> in market proportions. Mm -hmm. And um, what I, uh, I'm calling, at least at the moment, the World Bond Stock Fund. 
let's call it. Mm -hmm. And so the question was then, all right, if, and I sort of maybe invest in something like it, but not very much like it probably, it's certainly passive, but mm -hmm. um, so, uh, and I certainly have the tips. Mm -hmm. But so then the question was, all right, if you really wanted to invest in this thing today, given what's available, what would you do? So I looked at various uh, index funds, ETFs, with a very, very careful eye on expense ratios, mm, sure. because expense ratios, as they, you know, they can add up. Can add up hugely, and um, so I ended up with, and I actually, in July, I invested in this. <laughs> I, I put a, some of my money uh, in this exact portfolio. Mm -hmm. um, and what is it? Well, it, it has four components. And this is partly, it, it would have three or two or one, ideally, mm -hmm. if the index fund industry would give us the vehicles. Mm -hmm. And I have been badgering my Joel Dixon and others at Vanguard for many, many years to actually create this fund uh -huh. for us. Uh, and, um, but they haven't yet, nor has any, as far as I know, anyone else. So it has four components, and the, the reason it's four is the fees are lower if you use these four and then, then some other. And they're all, they all happen to be Vanguard. Mm -hmm. um, you could come close with Schwab or Fidelity. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they are a U.S. total stock market mm -hmm. fund, a non-U.S. what amounts to a proxy for total stock market fund. Mm -hmm. um, a U.S. bond, total bond market fund, mm -hmm. and then a non-U.S. total bond market fund. Mm -hmm. Now, I should say the, uh, the non-U.S. bond fund is currency hedged, and I'm, I'm not sure how I feel about that, mm -hmm. but it is, that's what it is, and there, there aren't many that fit that, that are not currency hedged, and I'm not sure that may not be a good idea, but I, I don't have a full... I think it, I could build an equilibrium model where that would work if everybody held currency held portfolios mm -hmm. um, but I haven't thought that through um, and uh, so those are the funds and then the question is how much do you put right, in the each portions one, and how do you keep them up to date mm -hmm. as it were uh, it turns out that the two stock funds have indices you know they're they track indices for which the providers publish market caps. Mm -hmm. And these are all float adjusted, by the way, mm -hmm. so <clears throat> they don't include bonds held by the Fed or the European Bank, ECB, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and uh, so, so in the case of, of the non-US, it's a FTSE index. FTSE publishes market caps for their indices every month in about seven to ten days after the month end. Uh, for the U.S., it's a crisp index, mm -hmm. and that's probably, they publish quarterly, mm -hmm. a few days, a week or two, uh, ten days after the end of the quarter. And, uh, but unfortunately, the bond funds are indices, they're Barclays indices. Mm -hmm. Barclay does not publish market caps. Right. Uh, if you want to spend $20,000 and get a license, you can probably get them, but, but ordinary people can't. So for those, I use other indices. Um, I think one's a Citibank index, and I can't remember what the other one is. Maybe they both are. I think they both are, mm -hmm. where you can get market caps. Mm -hmm. And so the idea is that as soon you, after the end of the quarter, you start looking at these sites mm -hmm. until you get all your market caps for the four. And then what you do is you look at last night's value of the funds and compare them with the value at the end of the quarter. Mm at the 10 days ago, let's say, and then you sort of do an adjustment, okay. and then you rebalance. And I've only rebalanced this once, hmm. uh, and uh, I only had to move about, it was about a third of 1% of my money oh. uh, to rebalance it, but that's on a quarter, sure, that's one quarter, sure. yeah. but hopefully it'll be low turnover. Okay. There, there are also, you can also get a feel for this. Um, FTSE has uh, a tool that's available publicly for playing with, quote, adaptive asset allocation, which is mm -hmm. a procedure which I wrote about in a, mm -hmm. an article three or four years ago. Mm -hmm. 
and you can play around with that using some of their data. Right, so that's something that a robo-advisor might be able to do, is to help oh, yeah. adjust the weights. Well, if I can do it, a robo-advisor <laughs> can do it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, but I mean, but, but, but hopefully Vanguard will, or Fidelity or somebody or Schwab will put them out of business for, mm -hmm. on that, that part of it right, by just right. doing it. Sure, exactly. I mean, I mean, it would be so easy, you know, for anybody to create a fund of funds out of those funds. Right. Um, and adjust the weights for you, mm -hmm. and um, and then you mix that with tips. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, and and you know, voila, you got it. You're done. <laughs> Terrific. That sounds. And, like and it's just a matter of how you weight it with the tips. Now, uh, your equilibrium theorists will tell you. Now, wait a minute. If a bunch of people are going to hold that plus tips, mm -hmm. how are the markets going to clear? Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, you, you can you can build a story in which you know, and there are also government bonds. You have to worry about that. But in some sense, young people, mm. you know, young people um, are on the other side of that. Right. I mean, they're right. the issuers of those government bonds. They're going to have to pay mm -hmm. up. Right. So so you can argue that that old people are on one side of that deal, and young people are on the other, and then you get a market equilibrium. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you really that's, a little, are, that's very casual theory. You're thinking about the say. big picture. Yeah. I try to. I try to yeah. try not to be demonstrably inconsistent with a larger worldwide market equilibrium story. Right. So stocks and bonds seem to be really part of your overall portfolio. What about other asset classes like uh, real estate or natural resources? Uh, well, first I, I would point out that. In, in that stock and bond portfolio, you've got a lot of exposure to real estate. You've got REITs, right. you know, for the real estate. You've got the real estate held by insurance companies. Mm -hmm. You've got the real estate of, you know, every retailer's, mm -hmm. you know, store uh, and possibly land. So there's a lot of, a lot of real estate in there. Um, and private equity, yes. Uh, it would be nice to have sort of a way to get a piece of that. Um, unicorn startups mm -hmm. in Silicon Valley, yes. We're beginning to see a little bit of those private shares sort of held by, by uh, mutual funds, although they tend not to be in the indices. Um, but uh, individuals have their own holdings of real estate if you own your house. Mm -hmm of your human capital in your job. If you're in the tech industry, you've got some human capital in the tech industry. So yes, it would be nice to have broader exposure uh, to some things that are not on public markets, but somehow that, that doesn't keep me up at night. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Maybe it should. Right. Well, on behalf of all investors around the world, I want to thank you for your incredible theories uh, and the implementation. You've really transformed financial markets uh, and you've helped investors secure their financial futures. And I uh, really appreciate your spending time with us today to tell us about the perfect portfolio. I would thank you. I'd just say one more thing to the individual investors who might be watching. That's how you invest, but you've got to save enough first. Mm. And most people, many people, are not. Right. That's actually a very important point. <laughs> uh, any ideas about how to go about doing that? <laughs> that is Sacrifice. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, um, I mean, the numbers are staggering when you look at longevity mm. uh, and just do simple calculations. Yeah. You've just got to save an awful lot um, because nobody else is going to do it for you except Social Security. Right. And um, while some of us might wish to have more generous Social Security, especially for at least for lower income, mm. that's probably not going to happen. Right. Another challenge. Well, hopefully you're continuing to work on that for the rest I of am. us. I am. I and I'm writing programs. That. Okay. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much, Bill. We My appreciate it. My great pleasure. It. Thank yeah. you. Yeah.